sure there was panic, but it, it was not the kind of uh, noble panic like on the Titanic. It, it was just so quick. Fourteen minutes is absolutely in incredible for such a big ship to sink. Pointe-au-Père was well known to mariners even before the first lighthouse was built there in 1859. Located on the south shore of the St. Lawrence, the area is known for its thick fog, and it was fog that brought about one of the greatest disasters in Canadian maritime history. On May 29, 1914, the Empress of Ireland collided with the Norwegian coal carrier Storstad. The Empress sank in 14 minutes. 1,012 people perished. The St. Lawrence River, gateway to the Great Lakes. This massive stretch of water linking the heartland of North America to the Atlantic Ocean is one of the busiest and most treacherous shipping routes in the world. Heavy traffic, strong currents, and shifting shoals make navigation hazardous. But the greatest danger is fog. To ensure safe passage, captains must rely on pilots for navigational guidance. Armed with an intimate knowledge of the river, the pilot maneuvers the vessel through the perilous water. It's a tradition that dates back 500 years. So what a ship would do, the ship would come near the south shore, uh, get a, a lifeboat or a small craft down, and row to the shore and knock on someone's door and tell them, do you know the St. Lawrence River? Do you want to pilot the ship up to Quebec City? Point au Père, or Father Point, as it is more commonly known among navigators, became a gathering place for pilots. The first lighthouse was built in 1859. As an additional aid to navigation, a wireless telegraph station was established. The year was 1909, and Marconi's new invention was as yet unproven. But the station would play a critical role in two of the most extraordinary events in Canadian maritime history. The story begins in Rimouski, a short distance from pointe au -Père. For many years, the town was the drop-off and pickup point for transatlantic mail. A Royal Mail contract was a lucrative source of additional revenue for the shipping lines. The Canadian Pacific Railway, already well established in trans-Pacific shipping, was eager to expand its presence on the Atlantic. With that in mind, the company ordered two 20-knot steamships to be built. They would be named the Empress of Britain and the Empress of Ireland. In May 1914, the Royal Mail steamship Empress of Ireland prepared to leave Quebec City on what was to be her 96th voyage. The passenger list reflected the class structure of Edwardian society. The majority were working class immigrants, traveling in third class and steerage. Second class, which was only half full, was comprised of middle class families. First class was reserved for the rich and famous. In all, there were 1,057 passengers on board. In command was Captain Henry George Kendall, a celebrity on both sides of the Atlantic. Four years earlier, Kendall had played a key role in one of the most captivating stories of the century. At that time, Kendall was captain of the Montrose on a routine transatlantic voyage. On board was Scotland Yard's most notorious criminal, wanted for the murder and mutilation of his wife. The man was hoping to escape to Canada with his mistress. To avoid suspicion, the couple traveled incognito. The woman was dressed as a boy. 
The man was Dr. Harvey Crippen. He was not really a doctor. He was actually a dentist. And he made himself some gold teeth. So that was the main thing recognizable. If ever he was disguising, the gold teeth would stay there, obviously. And Captain Kendall knew that from the newspaper articles. And uh, he started getting suspicious about a couple on the ship. He was with, with his uh, supposed to be son, but they were holding hands all the time. And it was really suspicious. And uh, Kendall invited Crippen to a dinner. And um, he made them laugh, and he recognized Crippen by his gold teeth. So he said nothing, continued the dinner, and then uh, telegraphed here to the Marconi station saying that he really felt strongly that he, he, he thought Crippen was on board, and he was pretty sure about that. Scotland Yard detectives took a fast ship past the Montrose and waited for Crippen at Pointe au Pere. Disguised as a pilot, Chief Inspector Walter Dew boarded the Montrose and arrested Crippen. It is reported that Crippen put a curse on Captain Kendall, proclaiming, you will suffer for this treachery, sir. The capture made headlines around the world. At the time, only 60 ships were fitted with Marconi wireless. But the publicity generated by the case resulted in the installation of Marconi sets as standard procedure. As for Crippen, he was found guilty of his wife's murder and hanged at Pentonville Prison. As Kendall gave the order to cast off from Quebec, he may have felt a mixture of excitement and apprehension. This was to be his first voyage on the Empress of Ireland. It was Thursday, the 28th of May, 1914. Among those traveling were 171 members of the Salvation Army. Their band performed an impromptu concert. Bandmaster Edward James Hannigan was traveling with his wife, Edith, and seven-year-old daughter, Gracie. Everything was just uh, almost out of this world. <laughs> and I was quite thrilled with it. It was just beautiful. It was like a lovely hotel, you know? of Ireland was built in Glasgow by the Fairfield Shipbuilding and Engineering Company. A twin-screw steamer of 14,500 tons, she was designed to travel at 20 knots. Ten transverse bulkheads formed 11 watertight compartments. In theory, any two adjacent bulkheads could be flooded without risk of sinking. As a direct result of the loss of the Titanic two years earlier, New Board of Trade regulations demanded stricter safety precautions. Accordingly, the Empress doubled her life-saving capacity to 40 boats, enough to hold more than 1,800 people. At 12.50 a.m., the Empress stopped all engines. The Lady Evelyn, out of Rimouski, approached alongside to pick up and deliver mail. By this time, virtually all on board were sound asleep. Many would never wake up. As the Empress neared Pointe au Pere, she stopped to allow pilot Adelard Bernier to climb down onto the pilot boat, Eureka. It was a clear night. At 1.38 a.m., the lookout spotted a ship on the horizon. On the bridge, Captain Kendall estimated the oncoming vessel at six miles distance. At present speeds, the ships would pass each other in approximately 12 minutes. At 1.41 a.m., Kendall ordered the Empress to port the helm, a turn to the right. The oncoming vessel was the Storstad, a Norwegian collier. 
the powerful 6,000-ton ship was en route to Pointe au Père to pick up a pilot. Chief Officer Alfred Toftens, a 33-year-old Norwegian, was in command on the bridge. He clearly saw the Empress changing course, but his version of events claimed that the Empress turned to the left. Then suddenly, both ships were enveloped in fog. Well, it's, it is as if you would put a pillowcase over your head. You just don't see. And you have to use your, 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 your common sense, your earring, to hear the foghorns here and there, to hear the ships coming towards you. And uh, you, you have to be very careful, because collisions will happen very fast indeed. Nobody can say for sure what was going through the minds of Kendall and Toftons, but one thing is certain. Both men made serious errors of judgment. Contrary to normal procedure, Kendall took the extraordinary step of ordering both engines full astern, in effect, stopping the ship. On board the Storstad, Captain Thomas Anderson was in bed with his wife. Chief Officer Toftons should have called the captain to the bridge immediately as per standing orders. The mistakes were deadly. So they hit. The Storstad rammed the Empress right amidships, right in between the two funnels. The hole in the side of the Empress measured 350 square feet, and the St. Lawrence River rushed in at a rate of 60,000 gallons a second. The ship began to list almost immediately. The three of us were awakened. Somebody came to our door, knocked on the door, and told us to get out, that the boat was sinking. And so we just went, just as we were, and we, could, we were quite close to the stairs, but we could hardly climb because they were, the boat was listing so fast. My father met his father on the deck uh, as the boat was sinking and people were scrambling to get out and uh, they embraced and uh, he said to his father uh, well what do you think is going to happen dad so his father said to him he says i don't know what's going to happen son but whatever happens we're in god's hands that was the, the last he heard from his father so his father was never his body was never located The crew members knew when the ship is listing, you go near the water, because that's where usable lifeboats are, and uh, you can get easily in the water from there. But the passengers had the reflex to go the other way, to the highest point of the hull. So they ended up trapped there, alone. We finally got up to the deck, and we sat on the high part of the railing until the boat went down, and then we were thrown into the water. And as far as I know, the three of us were together for a few minutes. And then I found myself hanging onto a piece of wreckage. There was a, a lifeboat, and I called to the boat help. And whether he heard me or not, I don't know, but they came and they helped us into the boat. And as soon as I got on the store stead, the first thing I wanted was my parents. And the steward said, they're not on this boat, but he said, there's other boats coming. And he said, they'll probably be on that. So I clung to that for many, many days. My father, he decided that he would wait until the, the final plunge of the boat took place, planning to take a plunge from the, the deck as soon as he figured it was safe which he did. He was a good swimmer. And uh, he was coming near the end, I guess, and he saw um, a lady that had, had taken a life jacket, and she'd had it in the wrong position in her body, and she drowned. And uh, while he was in swimming around, I guess he got to the point where he didn't know whether he's going to survive or not. And he promised the Lord, he said, if you'll spare my life, I will agree to become a Salvation Army officer and do the work that my father 
will have laid down and I'll carry on from there. So my father clung to that life jacket. Most survivors were picked up by the Storstad. More help was on its way. The Empress's Marconi operator, Ronald Ferguson, had managed to send an SOS to the station at Pointe au Pere before the ship lost power. By the time the pilot boat Eureka and the Lady Evelyn arrived, there were very few left alive in the almost freezing water. But there were many extraordinary tales of survival. Gordon Davidson, a history professor from San Francisco, managed to swim the three and a half miles to shore. Perhaps the luckiest person on board was an Irish fireman named William Clark. Two years earlier, he had cheated death by surviving the Titanic. Whereas the Titanic had taken more than two hours to reach her watery grave, the Empress of Ireland had gone down in 14 minutes. The first news of the sinking of the Empress of Ireland was transmitted by wireless from Pointe au Pere. Immediate comparisons were made to the Titanic, which sank two years earlier. As with the Titanic, initial reports were inaccurate and misleading. One going so far as to proclaim no lives were lost. The stark truth was nowhere more evident than in the small town of Rimouski. In 1914, I was seven years old. That day, I was going to school when I saw the survivors arriving. They were taken to the clothing store. I remember one woman was dressed only in a gray woolen blanket. I was very frightened and thought, oh my God, what's happening? A man told me, these people are very lucky because they have survived. Many were not so lucky. The bodies are piling up, the bodies of the dead. The corpses were lined up along the quayside, many of them naked. Of the 138 children on board, only four survived. Seventeen members of the Salvation Army were buried in Toronto. The memorial service at the Mutual Street Arena was filled to capacity. An estimated 150,000 lined the funeral route to Mount Pleasant Cemetery. The Canadian government ordered a public inquiry into the tragedy. The proceedings lasted for 11 days. In the end, it came down to the fact that neither ship knew exactly where the other was. Both ships made navigational errors, the Empress stopping and the Storstad changing direction in the fog. As to why the ship went down so quickly, the tribunal cited failure to close the watertight doors as the main cause. However, most of the blame was laid on the Storstad's first officer, Alfred Toftons. When the fog set in, he should have informed Captain Anderson immediately. The Norwegians were furious. Shortly afterwards, they held their own inquiry. It absolved the Storstad crew from all responsibility for the accident. Salvage operations commenced almost immediately. The CPR was under pressure to recover the remains of passengers trapped below deck. Divers also retrieved bags of royal mail, the purser's safe, and silver bullion worth over a million dollars. Over the years, divers have retrieved a wealth of artifacts from the ill-fated Empress. In all, 465 people survived the disaster. Gracie Hannigan's parents both perished on the Empress. For the rest of her life, Gracie was haunted by fear of running water. She died the 15th of May, 1995. She was 88. 
Ernest Green kept his promise, he rose through the ranks of the Salvation Army to retire as a lieutenant colonel. He died in 1972, aged 81. Every year on the Sunday nearest the 29th of May, the Salvation Army holds a memorial service at Mount Pleasant Cemetery in Toronto. Captain Anderson continued to work for the Norwegian Klavnes Line. In 1917, the Storstad was torpedoed off the Irish coast, but Anderson and his crew survived. Captain Kendall served in the Royal Navy during the First World War. After the war, he returned to the CPR where he served as a Marine Superintendent in London. He died in 1965 at age 91. The obituary in the London Times recalled his fame as the captor of Crippen. The Empress of Ireland wasn't even mentioned. In 1975, the lighthouse at Pointe au Père was shut down. A year later, in recognition of its importance to navigation on the St. Lawrence River, the lighthouse, along with its outbuildings, was declared a National Historic Site. 1,012 people perished on the Empress of Ireland. 172 crew members and 840 passengers. More passengers than either the Titanic or the Lusitania. But the world soon forgot about the tragedy on the St. Lawrence. Less than a month after the sinking, another incident in another place captured the attention of the media and the public. That place was Sarajevo, the flashpoint for the First World War.